Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teaches, Romeo and Juliet. In this video, we are going to be looking at Act 1, Scene 5, which is the moment where Romeo and Juliet meet for the first time. So it's a very, very important one. Let's get started. Quick plot summary then. So we start off in Capulet's party. It's full of life, excitement, uh, lots and lots of guests, lots and lots of people. Capulet's in his element, uh, wishing everyone well, looking for more lights, more drinks, more dancing. It's all very, very, very positive. And it's in this scene that Romeo, there with his friends, hoping to spy Rosaline, in fact, sees someone else, sees Juliet. And so he spends a little moment just looking at her because she sort of stood up and wondering who she is and thinking about how beautiful she is. And it's in this moment that Tybalt sees him. And even though he's still wearing his mask as a disguise, Tybalt says, well, I, I know his voice. Um, I know that that is Romeo. And he is livid. He is so, so angry that he is ready to, to draw his sword and fight him in that moment. And it's only because Capulet stops him. Capulet, uh, at first, very pleasantly, is like, no, come on, leave him be. This is a party. And then becomes very, very stern with him at the end, prompting Tybalt uh, to, to feel really hard done by and like he needs to make things uh, equal so he's got a little bit of kind of grrr for Romeo from that point onwards. Um, the scene then moves to the very very famous first kind of conversation between Romeo and Juliet uh, where he approaches her and they end up having a kiss but unfortunately at the end of this moment Romeo discovers that she is in fact a Capulet because he, uh, he asks the nurse who she is and Juliet, on asking the nurse, finds out that he is a uh, he is a Montague. And so both of them, by the end of the scene, have realised that they have very quickly uh, fallen in love with their family's enemy. Um, so, yes, <laughs> let's have a bit of a deep dive into the scene because there is a lot to talk about. So this moment is when Romeo sees Juliet for the first time. So we're just going to move past the sort of celebratory nature of Capulet's speech and get straight into the love stuff. Um, so first off, we can see the high emotion that Romeo feels when seeing Juliet for the first time. We have an introduction to start off this speech. Oh, she doth to teach the torches to burn bright. So this exclamative and the interjection, high passion, high emotion, the star, uh, the, she does teach the torches, so we've got personification, i.e. they're able to learn. The torches are, of course, a metaphor for the stars. So he's saying she is like above the stars. She shines brighter. She's more beautiful than the stars. And then this light and dark imagery, she's better than the stars, is continued where it seems she hangs upon the cheek of night like a rich jewel in an Ethiop's ear. So again, we've got a simile here that suggests that she is this kind of glistening brightness. Beauty too rich for use for earth too dear. Slightly complicated use of inversion there in this exclamative. Um, so you can see that the sentences are balanced, but they're almost opposites of each other. Too rich for use for earth too dear. And this is a kind of almost like paradox of her. Um, she is too beautiful to be used, i.e. to kind of carry out a normal function in this world, but also she's too precious, she's too costly for the earth to take, i.e. she shouldn't be taken by death or taken in by the earth because she is, she is too precious. So she is both not for this world, but also she shouldn't be taken from it. Um, it's basically all suggesting like her absolute sort of worth and value and how precious and unique she is. This is continued with this lovely zoomorphic metaphor. Uh, so shows a snowy dove trooping with crows. We've also got colour symbolism again that focuses on light and dark. Obviously the adjective snowy suggesting whiteness, crows are black in colour. Um, the fact that he uses the metaphor of a dove is pretty interesting here because obviously they are quite religious symbols and symbols of peace um, and innocence as well. So again, elevating her status. And now everyone around her, note the pluralisation of crows, um, is a crow in comparison. Um, and you might be thinking to yourself, um, 
hang on a minute. Wasn't it just in the previous scenes that he was, Benvolio was saying that he was going to make Rosaline the swan turn into a crow? Well, yeah, he was right because suddenly his Romeo, Rosaline is gone from his mind. Um, so it's tro trooping with crows as yonder lady over a fellow shows the Mojadan are what her place of stand and touching hers make blessed my rude hand. So his hand has been personified as rude here. He's basically saying he is not worthy to touch her. But if he were to touch her, he would be blessed, i.e. starting off this idea that Juliet is something to be worshipped, that she's something religious and holy that could kind of like solve him, bless him. Did my heart love till now? Well, what a rhetorical question, um, because it, he's basically undermining all of the stuff that he was saying about Rosaline. Yeah, the before every, every feeling of love he thought he had had, he now realises isn't real. For swear it, right? So nice personification of his own sight here in this exclamative. So he's like saying, swear by it, sight. I never saw true beauty until this night. So the adjective true here is what undermines um, this kind of sense of love that he had previously. He's like, yeah, it wasn't real. It's only now that he sees having seen Juliet, how wrong he was. So Rosaline, eh, eh, now it's all Juliet. Now, some of you might be like, that's a bit fickle. And I get it. I get it. You don't really want someone that can change love that dramatically. But I think what Shakespeare is trying to do is elevate the love that he has for Juliet by demonstrating that what he thought was wonderful is actually nothing now that he really, truly understands what it is. OK, in classic Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet styling, we're going to move from a moment of incredible love to a moment of incredible hate. So here we are in this moment of conflict where Tybalt spots that it is Romeo. This by his voice should be a Montague. Fetch me my rapier boy. What bears a slave come hither? So immediately we've got use of imperatives. Fetch me my rapier. My rapier is a sword. So note how impulsive, how speedy, how quick he is to, to go to violence. Note the kind of sense of he sees it as audacious. He's like, how dare he? What dares the slave come hither, covered with an antic face, to fleer and scorn at our solemnity? So the assumption that Tybalt makes is Romeo is here to directly insult them as a family, not just in words, but in presence, that it is a he is disrespecting, he's dishonouring them with his presence. Um, so this is all about the sense of reputation. Can Tybalt stand by and let his family be insulted by the presence of a Montague in the party? Which is why he says, now by the stock and honour of my kin, stock and honour, so status and honour of my kin, my family, to strike him dead, I hold it not a sin. So the irony in that, of course, of course it's a sin. It's one of the greatest sins. But because of the slight to his reputation, he sees it as being um, the opposite of that, that it is just and right and true. Capulet, this is big Capulet, Daddy Capulet, Juliet's father, um, comes in and is shocked by this sort of reaction. He's like, why, how now, kinsman? Wherefore storm you so? Yeah, uh, so the storm is a metaphor for his rage. Wherefore, right, uh, means why. So he's like, why are you storming about? Why are you so angry? Um, uncle, this is a Montague, our foe, a villain that is hither come in spite to scorn at our solemnity this night. So note the way that Tybalt repeats the language that he used up here, OK, to scorn at our solemnity, scorn at our solemnity. Um, so he is expecting Capulet to have exactly the same feeling as him at this moment. Note as well here, we've got the inclusive uh, possessive pronoun our um, so it's our foe, it's it's the two of them together. And you've got all of this language of conflict, foe and villain and slave. 
to describe um, Romeo, but other um, words as well. So we've got spite, we've got the verb scorn, we've got verbs here, fleer and scorn again. So Tybalt is expecting Capulet to have exactly the same, to be just as whipped up with rage at this slight on their honour. But actually, it doesn't quite go as he's expecting. Look at the juxtaposition in the way that they talk about Romeo. Capulet says, young Romeo, is it? So there's no uh, negative overtone here at all. In fact, making reference to his youth, you might even suggest is quite positive. It's a reminder of his innocence. He's not part of Capulet's issue. Young Romeo, is it? Tis he that villain Romeo. OK, so massive juxtaposition showing the different viewpoints and attitudes of Capulet and Tybalt in this moment. And actually, Capulet goes further. So he tells him to chill out. Yeah, contently, gentle cuz, let him alone. Yeah, just chill out. He bears him like a portly gentleman. Yeah, and to say truth, Verona brags of him. OK, so he's a good man. He's considered well respected. Verona brags of him. OK, personification suggesting this kind of boasting of the greatness and then he explains why because to be a virtuous and well-governed youth those adjectives virtuous so he's good yeah he's not here to cause any harm and he's well governed so he's in control of himself he's not quick to temper he doesn't get involved in the fights capulet knows this about romeo so he's like, i'm not gonna for the wealth of all the town here in my house doing disparagement he's like not a chance Am I going to pick a fight with this kid? He's done nothing wrong. He's a good guy. And so good advice from Capulet here. Be patient. Take no note of him. It is my will the which of our respect show a fair presence and put off these frowns and ill seeming semblance for a feast. So here we are seeing Capulet in a nice way flexing his patriarchal power. He is the man in charge. He's daddy Cap. Yeah. So this is all about the hierarchy. Tybalt is beneath him. And so you can see it through the way that he uses imperatives. Be patient. Take no note. Put off these frowns. He's the one in charge. But at this moment, he's doing it quite nicely. Unfortunately, Tybalt pushes. It fits when such a villain is a guest. OK, so again, we've got that juxtaposition between villain and guest. Uh, he's using guest kind of ironically. I'll not endure him. Check out these modal verbs So here. Obviously, it's in a contraction, but it's I will not endure him. And then he shall be endured. So this is like a lock ahead, like poof, Tibbot being like, I'm not going to do this. And Capulet being like, oh, yeah, you are. Yeah. So modal verbs of certainty from the both of them. He shall be endured. What good man, boy, I shall he uh, I say he shall go to. So the imperatives coming back again, but with interrogatives. Am I the master here or you? That's more a rhetorical question. He's not expecting Tybalt to respond, but it shows his disbelief in Tybalt's defiance. He's like, what do you think you're doing? You think you're the master? Another thing coming. And now exclamative, getting angry. You'll not endure him? God shall mend my soul. So he's like, what do you think you're doing? So conflict is rising, but between these two characters, between the Capulets, not to do with Romeo. Again, we've got language of conflict coming up. You'll make a mutiny among my, my guests. You will set cock hoops. You'll create chaos. But this word here, mutiny, this abstract noun is really important because it was used in the prologue, wasn't it, from ancient grudge to new mutiny. So this tells us that Capulet is trying really hard to keep this kind of feuding at bay. He does not want to go against what the prince has said. And he knows that if Tybalt tries to antagonise Romeo in this moment, a full on Capulet Montague brawl will ensue. But Tybalt cannot see beyond sense of masculine honour and pride, one of the really big theme of this play, and that sense of reputation. When he says, why uncle, tis a shame, he doesn't mean, oh, that's a shame. He means this is shameful. 
Now that's important because actually that's a bit of an affront, a bit of an insult to Capulet because he's saying you're not doing enough to protect the honour of our family. Which, of course, makes Capulet very angry. And that's when we start to see these insults. Go to, go to, you are a saucy boy. Is it so indeed? This trick may chance to scathe you. I know what, you must contrary me, marry tis time. And then he calls him a princox. So again, we've got the patriarchal hierarchy being established here. He's the one in control. He's insulting Tybalt to his face. And then if you look at this bit, you are a princox, go, be quiet, or more light, more light, for shame, I'll make you quiet. So what we have here is this bit of parenthesis. This is him talking to the guests, and then at the same time, creating this sense of threat, be quiet, or I'll make you quiet. There's a threat of violence, there's even a threat of death there, perhaps hyperbole, but the meaning is clear, don't you mess with me. Notice the way that Capulet is kind of managing these two halves, the kind of joy and the happiness of the party, the love, and then the conflict going on, love and hate together. Oh, this is huge. Tybalt says, Patience perforce with willful collar meeting makes my flesh tremble in their different greeting. Note the way that we're using rhyming couplets now. So we know that this is big stuff. We know that this is like key messages. So you've got this juxtaposition between patience and collar. So the patience is what he's having to, to create now. He's, ha he's like, OK, be patient, chill out. Don't like I've been told, don't make a fuss. And the collar is his rage. So he's saying the patience and the rage are coming together and they are making his flesh tremble. That's not fear, that's rage. Okay, so that is rage. So he is literally, the fact that I'm having to stop myself here is making me tremble. So he makes the decision, I will withdraw. Okay, I'll do what I'm told. But this intrusion, so Romeo's presence, shall now seeming sweet convert to bitter gall. So more juxtaposition, another metaphor. He's like, I'm gonna seem sweet now, but this is gonna, this is gonna change. It's gonna convert to bitter gall, to poison, to bile. So he's, he's saying, you just wait. Plop, catalyst. This is huge. OK, because this is the moment. If it wasn't for this moment, OK, Tybalt wouldn't have a grudge. Tybalt wouldn't be after Romeo. We can see that Capulet thinks really highly of Romeo. And oh, it's one of those moments of, of stress because you're like, but if they just told him, it would probably be OK. But sadly, that would make for a short and not quite so dramatic play. OK, conflict within a scene of love. We're now moving back to the love section because this is where Romeo and Juliet meet. Now, I've just got this little chunk. There's more to talk about, but this little chunk of their meeting together. And what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that it is in sonnet form. OK, so if you forgotten what a sonnet looks like, a Shakespearean sonnet, I should um, just qualify 14 lines. OK, three quatrains with a rhyming couplet at the end. A, B, A, B rhyme scheme in each of the quatrains and a rhyming couplet at the end. This is a perfect sonnet form. It abides by all of the rules, but it's spoken between Romeo and Juliet. Why? Perfect love. Perfect sonnet form. Perfect love. And the fact that they share the sonnet shows that they're united together. So this is demonstrating that this is requited love, it is balanced, it is shared, it is perfect. However, we know that Shakespeare doesn't just get into the soppy stuff. He always has to remind us of the kind of darker side. When was the last time we saw a sonnet being used in Romeo and Juliet? Oh yeah, the prologue. The prologue, which was full of language to do with conflict, where we learnt that they were gonna die. So by using sonnet form here, 
Shakespeare is not only reminding us or telling us that their love will be true and perfect, he is also reminding us of the tragedy of this love, of the tragic fate that they have ahead of them, their death. He can never just let us enjoy it. Let's look at it in a little bit more detail. So just looking at the first two quatrains. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle fine is this. My lips two blushing pilgrims ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. OK, so we've got personification going in again about the idea of his hand being unworthy and rude and his hand being able to create sense of profanity. Um, again, we've got this idea of um, a religious slight that him touching her would be a religious slight. You should be able to see this semantic field of religious worship being started here. So he refers to Julia as a metaphor, as a holy shrine, so something to be worshipped, a journey, yeah, a journey to be taken to Juliet. Um, it's an extended metaphor because it runs the whole way through. My lips two blushing pilgrims, another, <clears throat> another metaphor um, that adds to this extended one. So his lips are pilgrims. Pilgrims go on a journey, yeah, to the shrine. Julia is at the end of that journey. His lips, it's basically saying everything that he has done in the past has been building up to this moment, ready to uh, ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. He's, he's, he's asking permission uh, to kiss her. Okay, Julia takes his language, develops it. So she calls him good pilgrim. You do wrong your hands too much, which manly devotion shows in this. She's like, hey, stop it. You don't need to be self-deprecating. You don't need to say that you're unworthy. And then she clarifies um, for saint of hand that pilgrim's hand do touch and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. So um, what we've got here is um, he's saying, hang on, don't be doing that. And she's kind of giving him another alternative, basically saying, well, we're not going to kiss straight away because saints have hands. And actually, that would normally be palm to palm. So she's not saying no. She's being perhaps a little bit coy. But the fact that she uses repetition and uses the same words demonstrates that they're on the same page. So it's, it's sort of quite flirty in nature. But she's also being quite careful, not just getting straight into a good old pash. Although, let's be fair, it's on its way. And then the uh, last quatrain of the rhyming couplet, um, have not saints lips and holy palmers too, I pilgrim lips that they must use in prayer. So uh, we've got the same idea here. So again, little interrogative. So he's challenging, he's questioning, like her take on the metaphor. Um, and then again, we've got this repetition um, being used by Juliet to sort of say the other side. I pilgrim lips that they must use in prayer. So again, she's saying, no, 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 no kissing for you. We use our lips for praying. So note the way that the semantic field is being continued, uh, which builds into this extended metaphor. Oh, then, dear saint, so addressing her directly with this metaphor, let lips do what hands do, cheeky old Romeo. They pray as in they come together. Grant thou, lest faith turn to despair. So juxtaposition between faith and despair. He's like, please, or like, I'll be devastated. Um, Juliet says, saints do not move, they grant for prayer's sake, then move not while my prayer's effect I take. Um, I note that all the way through this, we've got the sequence of adjacency pairs. That basically means he says something, she says something, he says something, she says something. And it's really, really balanced. So again, it's demonstrating their sort of togetherness in this case. And as he says, well, don't move while my prayers affect I take, he's saying, if you stand still, I'll come to you. I'll kiss you. So that's the end of the sonnet, which ends with this moment of them having a kiss. So it's sort of, it's a perfect development. When the next bit, thus on my lips by yours, my sin is purged. So then there's an idea that he's been like purified, like he's been blessed um, by the notion of having kissed her. And Juliet, quite sort of cheekily, 
you know, then have my lips the sin they have took. So, oh gosh, have I got your sin? Giving Romeo the opportunity to kiss again, because he says, sin from thy lips, O trespass, sweetly urged, give me my sin again. So he's, it's an invitation to keep kissing her. But what you might notice here is that we're back to another uh, of ABAB rhyme scheme. So it's almost like this is the beginning of another sonnet, that this is the first quatrain of another sonnet. You might say to me, yeah, hang on, miss, uh, again and took, doesn't rhyme. But that's actually because here what we have is a shared line between Romeo and Juliet so if Romeo had carried on the line of meter it would go to the hair and you can see you kiss by the book book rhymes with took so it is actually still part of that ABAB rhyme scheme it's just a shared line between Romeo and Juliet another thing that demonstrates their togetherness in this moment a lot of people ask, like, you kiss by the book, what does that sort of mean? Does it mean you're good at kissing? Does it mean you kiss like, like an instruction manual would tell you to? I'm not sure that Juliet would know one way or the other. But what is important here is that it doesn't continue at this moment. There's an interruption. If sonnets are representations of this kind of like pure love and you get your first one, which is the pure love that builds to the kiss. And then in, in this next bit, they're looking to kiss again. The sonnet doesn't finish because the nurse comes in and says, Madam, your mother craves a word with you. So symbolically, this is like a kind of hint of what is going to get in the way of Romeo and Juliet the family, the parents, the mother, is going to be what sort of stops this true love from really coming to fruition. And then the final part that we need to talk about is, of course, the moment where both Romeo and Juliet discover who each other are. So Romeo says, is she a Capulet? A little interrogative suggesting, oh, no. Oh, dear account, my life is my foe's debt. So that's quite an interesting one to think about because he could be calling his life Juliet, like Juliet is his life and she is his foe's debt. So what comes from Capulet? Or it could be my, my life is now in my enemy's hands. So I owe them because I love her. OK, but no, there's no kind of like, oh, well, that's it. He's just like, this is this is a bit of a disaster. Juliet later asks the nurse, uh, go ask his name. If he be married, my grave is like to be my wedding bed. Well, hello, foreshadowing. Thank you, Shakespeare, for reminding us of, of the tragedy in this moment, created by dramatic irony, because, of course, we know as the audience that that's exactly what's going to happen. And you know what? When she, when her grave is her wedding bed, it's because it's Romeo that she's actually married. So we, this is a, a really horrible moment of tragedy and pathos being created through foreshadowing and dramatic irony. And then very similar sentiments um, from Juliet. He says, my only love sprung from my only hate. Um, note the repetition of, of only here. So the, 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 the kind of uniqueness of the love and the only thing that she's been taught to hate is the Montagues um, and I like the verb sprung here the kind of suddenness from it but it could also be like born by Montague too early seen unknown and known too late and then oh prodigious birth of love it is to me that I must love a loathed enemy note that we're in rhyming couplets again here cementing how significant this moment is um, prodigious birth prodigious in this case means um like ominous a sort of sense of dread birth of love we've got the metaphor so it's very very ominous this idea that this birth of love is bringing on dark things more foreshadowing that i must love a loathed enemy note the kind of i've said sense of inev inevitability here um mainly through that modal verb must it's like there's no way out of it for her now this is it she must love because it, it has begun. OK, final thoughts from me. Obviously, this is a scene about love because we have 
Romeo and Juliet meeting for the first time, perfect love of the sonnet, the way that Romeo views her and how it completely cancels out any uh, love for uh, previous ladies like Rosaline. We, of course, have conflict. We've got the conflict between Tybalt and Romeo, not that Romeo is aware of it. We've got the conflict between Tybalt and Capulet and the way that that actually fuels the narrative of the play, um, bringing on the kind of further conflict between Romeo and Tybalt. What is really interesting about the scene is the structure of it. The structure of the scene goes love, hate, love, that reminder that actually with love always comes hate, always comes conflict, one of the major themes of the play. We've got fate being, uh, we're being reminded of fate again, not just because we're reminded of the prologue, um, because of the sonnet form, but in the way that there's a sort of sense of ominous foreboding in the way that Juliet particularly speaks at the end, were as an audience being reminded of the fate of their death. Patriarchal structures, massive here, seeing um, that control that Capulet has over his family. It's not just Juliet, it is everyone in his families and the way that that um, structure and hierarchy is perceived. Masculine honour and reputation hand in hand here. Um, the fact is, is that Tybalt's masculine honour and sense of reputation has been challenged twice. It's been challenged in his mind by Romeo's presence, even though Romeo did not mean it to be uh, a, a slight on his honour. But that is how Tybalt has interpreted it. But he has also had his sense of honour and pride damaged by Capulet because of the way that one Capulet didn't listen to him and didn't agree with him, but to the way he then insulted and threatened him. And all of that feeling of that anger that builds because of the slight of his masculine honour and his reputation is moving and developing to, towards further conflict and hate, pushing us towards those terrifyingly violent scenes later on between Tybalt, Romeo and the gang. I know that was a long one, but what a, a brilliant and powerful and important scene it is. So it was worth it, I hope. Hope you found it useful and interesting. If you've got any questions, please do just drop me a little line in the uh, comments and I will get back to you. If you haven't subscribed, click that button because then you'll know when Act 2 is ready for you, along with all of the other videos I'm making to help support you in your English language and literature studies, whether that's GCSE or A-level or just for a bit of fun. That's it for me. Thank you so much for watching. Happy revising.